I'm Paul E. Cooley, and today is Sunday, March 28th, 2020. Hello, fiendlings! How the hell are ya? I know quite a few of you out there are looking for new distractions. Well, I have one for you. How about nearly two and a half months of story? Every day, I'm going to post an episode of The Derelict Saga. That's three parts of the five-part series. Book four is still in production for various reasons, but I imagine it will be coming at you later this year. So, what is Derelict? First off, the Derelict Saga is not traditional space opera nor military sci-fi. If you're expecting a culture from today simply plopped in space in the future, you're going to be sorely disappointed. So do me a favor and keep your comments to yourself such as, That's not how things work in the military. It's my universe. Fuck off. That's what Derelict is not. What Derelict is, is horror survival mixed with high technology and two threats that might spell the end of humanity. I'm being a bit vague here, but that's more or less the deal. By the end of the first episode, you'll know if it's something you're interested in. I know a lot of folks have been furloughed or lost their gigs for the time being. I'm potentially in the same boat. So if you have a Kindle Unlimited membership or an Audible subscription, do me a favor. When you have some time or the cash or a credit, purchase or read one of my ebooks or audiobooks. Every bit is going to help. I don't run commercials on this channel for ideological reasons, and I'll keep the jibber-jab to a minimum during the Derelict Saga run, but expect to hear from me every Sunday, because that's how I roll. All that aside, it's time for us to get into the episode. Be safe, have a great week, I'll have another ep for you tomorrow. Thanks for watching, listening, and reading. Cheers. Prologue the observatory scanners fired radio waves and laser radar beams through the Kuiper Belt. Orbiting Pluto, the Exo Observatory, or PEO, had two missions. Finding new celestial bodies entering the Sol system and cataloging the larger bodies floating in the void. The PEO astronomers and an AI discovered, tagged, and calculated trajectories for objects larger than 50 meters in diameter. After 70 years of operation, the station's personnel had only managed to catalog an estimated 20% of the belt. They had yet to scratch the surface of what it contained. Mickey, the observatory AI, ran the astronomer's sweeps for them, analyzed the data, and helped the humans make sense of the belt. When it had nothing to do, the AI continued its own sweeps independent of its programmed orders, it also scanned for laser, radio waves, and repeating light beams in an effort to find evidence of exosolar life, which it had failed to do so in 70 years of operation, although it had found many exosolar bodies entering Sol system. The AI finished the astronomer's programs and immediately loaded its next set of planned sweeps. After several minutes, it received a ping more than one astronomical unit, or AU, from Pluto a little further than the distance from Earth to Sol. Mickey dumped the rest of the sweep program and focused all the instruments on the origin. The ping repeated, this time with more information. Mickey compared the signal's signature to those stored in its database. A fast search brought up a set of encrypted instructions. The AI decrypted the data packet and the program opened like a flower. It executed the series of commands, recorded the results, and crafted an encrypted message. In less than a second, it had the entire data payload ready to transmit. It pointed one of the antennae toward Neptune, fired the packets, and scrubbed the message logs, removing records of both the data and the transmission itself. No human would ever know it had sent a private message to Neptune. Mickey resumed its scheduled sweeps, ignoring the repeated signal. Roughly two and a half standard hours later, the data packet arrived at Trident Station orbiting Neptune. An autonomous subroutine captured the packet, deciphered the signature, and forwarded it to the TRIO, the Trident Station AIs. After the message was decrypted and analyzed, the TRIO, three independent AIs acting as a single governing body for the station, argued and debated for more than a standard minute. Once they reached a decision, they sent a new instruction set to Mickey. The PEO would carry out their instructions. All the trio had to do was wait until the humans started asking questions.
Book One, SNR Black. Chapter One. The chilly and lifeless office, decorated with the detritus of a dead age, screamed anachronism. Captain Eric Dunn hated it. Amidst the antiques, the hollow display proclaiming Seoul Federation Marine Corps looked out of place and garish. He'd been in this room many times in the past, and each time it seemed to suck away another part of his soul. Dealing with executive officers could do that. Colonel Hayes was such a bureaucratic prick, he might as well be the poster child for inefficiency and pomposity. Dunn would be glad when the man's tour finally called him back to the Martian SFMC base or a cushy post at Titan Station. But for all he knew, that could be years away, and it would be a long time before Dunn's own tour ended. Dunn stood with his hands behind his back just a few feet away from the ornate wooden desk. Cherry if he remembered correctly. It seemed as though the first time someone entered Hayes' office, the man had to detail the age and antiquity of all the natural furniture. Dunn sincerely hoped the colonel would quickly get to the point of the briefing, else it was going to be a very long day. The private door to the inner office opened. Dunn, still standing at parade rest, didn't flick his eyes away from the brilliant colors of Neptune peeking at him through the observation window. In his peripheral vision, he saw Hayes linger at the threshold as if waiting for his subordinate to acknowledge his existence. Fat chance, Dunn thought. After a few seconds, the room filled with an awkward, tense silence. He knew it was driving the colonel crazy, and he refused to give ground to the man. Just hold it for a few more seconds, and... Captain? Dunn turned his body in a neat swivel, his boots silent on the Atmos steel floor. He quickly moved his hands from behind his back and saluted. Good afternoon, Colonel. Hayes' mouth twitched slightly. Whether in amusement or disgust, it was impossible to tell. After a second or two, Hayes grunted and headed to his desk. As you were, Captain. Have a seat. Thank you, sir, Dunn said in a flat monotone. He sat in the uncomfortable antique chair while wishing he was in full combat gear. Then, he could get away with scuffing and denting the damn thing. But as long as he was dressed in his jump fatigues, that would never happen. The wood creaked slightly beneath his 91-kilogram frame. The sound made him want to smile. Colonel Hayes glanced briefly at the private hollow display hanging before his eyes, and then moved it aside. He tented his hands on the clean, sterile cherry wood desktop and smiled. It was a predator's grin, filled with white teeth and no shred of humor. Captain, how's your team? Dunn raised an eyebrow. My team, sir? Yes, is your team firing on all cylinders? Yes, sir, Dunn said, confusion coloring his words. We lost five Marines to end of tour, but the replacements we gained are already gelling well. I expect they'll be ready for action in the next month or two. Next month or two, the colonel echoed. I'm afraid you're not going to have that kind of time. Dunn felt a chill. The look on the colonel's face was one of excitement. That didn't bode well. May I ask why not, sir? Hayes tapped the air in front of him, and a twin-faced hollow display appeared to the side. The two men could still see one another's faces while glancing at the display itself. A gray and white space station appeared against a field of black, speckled with pinpoints of distant light. A label appeared beneath it. Pluto Exo Observatory. Hayes pointed at it. You familiar? Yes, sir. I studied astronomy as a kid. I know PEO is the most distant human-occupied object in space. The colonel nodded. Apart from the occasional Exo exploration ship, of course. He wanted to roll his eyes, but managed to tamp down the urge. Of course, sir. Yes, yes, of course. The colonel's annoying habit of repeating the last words spoken was enough to make Dunn grind his teeth. The man looked away from him and back to the image dancing between them. That said, have you ever heard of the Mira? Dunn felt another chill. It was bad enough being in this grimly decorated office and dealing with a pasty-faced bureaucrat, but now he had to hear about ghost stories? Yes, sir. Exo-exploration ship. 
was on its way to Proxima Centauri B. Correct, the colonel said. And the human race lost contact with it 43 years ago. Dunn couldn't figure out if that was a question or a statement, so he simply nodded. The colonel either didn't see his response or didn't care. 43 years without so much as a radio signal. Presumed lost, sir, Dunn said. The colonel's eyes flipped to him, glinting with something manic. Not just presumed lost, Captain. All but dead and buried. The project shut down two years after we stopped receiving signals. No one was even listening for her anymore. Dunn felt another chill. Was, sir? The shark-toothed grin reappeared. Was, Captain. The project was reopened this morning. Sir? Hayes waved a finger at the display and pulled an image hiding in the bottom left corner. He put his index and thumb together and then pulled them apart in a diagonal. The image flipped up from the bottom bar and filled the display. Pinpoints of distant starlight and the aura in the Milky Way sat against a black background. What do you see? Dunn squinted at the image. His block, a cyber implant most spacefaring humans had, immediately corrected his corneas to better focus on it. The fuzz around the dots in the picture disappeared, leaving a razor-sharp picture. He relaxed his eyes, but the image stayed as vibrant as before. Thank you, bio nannies, he said to himself. Unless I'm mistaken, sir, that's a picture of space. The colonel rolled his eyes and then locked them with Dunn's. Can you be more specific? The view slid sideways into a moving panorama, showing off more stars and dots of blue and red. Exosolar? Dunn asked. Exosolar, correct. The colonel's eyes dragged away from his own and stared at the hollow. The panoramic view ceased, once more replaced by the still image. Now, let's take a look at it again. The starlight faded into the background, leaving amorphous shapes composed of different colors. Do you see anything out of the ordinary? The spectral analysis image looked normal to him, except for a faint shape in the top right quadrant. Its colors didn't match those of the other objects. Instead, it looked like a dead outline. He pointed at it. That doesn't look right, sir. No, the colonel agreed. No, it doesn't. And it's about to look even more abnormal. With a few finger movements, the image zoomed in on the tiny shape until it was front and center on the display. Once the display ceased moving, Dunn caught his breath. What he'd assumed was just another irregularly shaped rock now looked angular, well-defined. A ghostly reflection appeared in the middle of the strange image. Dunn whistled. That's a ship, he said. The chill he felt before evaporated into a frenzy of thoughts. You're saying that's Mira. The colonel looked disappointed for a moment and then sighed. Yes, Captain, that's Mira. Not possible, Dunn said. That's just not possible. Hayes grinned. Not only is it possible, Captain, it's been confirmed. The Pluto Exo Observatory has been monitoring that shape for over a week now, using every instrument they have on board. According to the PEO AI, that little bit of brightness there is a reflection of Pluto's light off the ship's surface. I personally don't believe its conclusions, nor does the trio. Damn, Dunn whispered. He opened his mouth to curse again and then remembered where he was and whom he was speaking to. He glanced at the colonel's frown. Sorry, sir. Don't mention it, Captain. I felt the same way when I first saw it. I didn't believe it either. Sir, have we tried to make contact? Hayes leaned back in his chair. After the data packets were sent to the Seoul Federation government, the AIs had a little meeting of the quantum brains and confirmed that it's the Mira. Since then, the PEO has attempted contact of every kind. They were given all the schematics for Mira's communication arrays, frequencies, and the like, and began beaming messages. There's been no response. No response, Dunn echoed. What about a distress beacon? The colonel leaned forward again, his hands tinting at the desk's far edge. I was wondering when you'd ask that. Yes, the beacon is in fact operating. Then why didn't they pick it up sooner, sir? Simple, Hayes said. No one was listening for it. 
That ship left Neptune 54 years ago and didn't exit Sol System until four years later. Its beacons and communications are outside the normally used frequencies, so its packets wouldn't be missed with all the noise from other stations and ship traffic. Once the project was shut down, no one was listening. Period. But Pluto heard her. Yes, Hayes said. Pluto's hearing her now. We don't know how long she's been sitting at the Kuiper Belt's edge or where the hell she came from, but she's back. Too far away to determine life signs, Dunn said to himself. Far too far, Hayes agreed. Dunn looked up at him in embarrassment, but the colonel didn't seem frustrated or surprised at his statement. No transmissions, no emissions, nothing. Mira's beacon is all we have as proof that anything still works on the ship. Dunn crossed his arms as he continued staring at the image. Amazing, he said. Never thought I'd hear of that ship again, apart from the conspiracy hollows. Hayes allowed himself a single laugh before his face tightened once again into a constipated expression. Yes, apart from the conspiracies, of which there seemed to be millions. He turned his head slightly to regard the image. And that brings us to the problem. Problem, sir? Yes, the problem, Captain. She's adrift in the Kuiper Belt, but she's still moving further into the Sol system. The AIs calculate she has a better than 50% chance of either colliding with one of the larger bodies or simply breaking up from a storm of Kuiper Belt ice. So, we need to bring her back. Now, he understood why the Colonel had sent for him. He also knew why Hayes had asked about his team. When do we leave, sir? 